listening practice tests. In the IELTS test, you hear some recordings and you have to answer questions on them. You have time to read the instructions and questions and check your work. All recordings are played only once. The test is in four sections. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman as the man inquires about piano lessons for his daughter. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now the full test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Good morning. Are you Mrs. Irving, the piano teacher? That's right. How can I help you? My name's Johnson. My eight-year-old daughter Emily really wants some piano lessons. She's been asking for them since last December. And she's now decided it should be her birthday present. Really? Well, I would be delighted to teach your daughter. How did you hear about me? Well, I spent a long time searching on the internet and checking notice boards in music shops. But in the end, a friend of mine told me about you and that you had done a great job with his young son. Well, that's nice to hear. Has Emily done any playing before? Not really. Her uncle has a piano, and he lets her play around in it when we visit him. He lives quite a long way away, though. Will Emily have a piano to practice on between lessons? This is really important if the lessons are to have a proper effect. I've looked into the costs of buying and hiring. Hiring a piano is quite cheap, so I'll do that to start with. If Emily really takes to it and wants to carry on long term, I'll end up buying one. I expect. Okay. Now, the way I work is to have my students come to my home for the lessons. Is that okay with you? Yes, that's fine. You live in Chatsworth Road, is that right? Yes, that's right. At number nine. So, how much will Emily need to practice? At the beginning, I would recommend that she has three practices of half an hour each week, with one of the practices being the day before the lesson. When she gets better, she will need to have the same number of practices, but maybe for longer periods. I suppose the more practice Emily does, the better she'll get, and the more rewarding the experience will be. Exactly. Now, when would Emily like to have her lessons? We thought that before school would be too early, and although Emily would like to do it after school, we think she might be too tired. Saturday mornings would seem to be the best. That would be fine. Is ten a.m. convenient? The lessons last an hour. That's fine. By the way, what do you charge for lessons? The basic cost is twenty-five pounds an hour. However, if you would like to book a series of ten lessons and pay in advance, I offer a ten percent discount, which would make it twenty-two pounds fifty a lesson. In addition, if you book and pay for twenty lessons in advance, I offer a twenty percent discount, which would make it twenty pounds a lesson.、Hmm, that's very interesting. What I will do is to book just five lessons to begin with. If Emily finds that she likes it, and if she is doing her practice, I'll book for longer and take advantage of the discounts. That's fine. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions six to ten. Now, Mr. Johnson, I have another beginner who would like to start at more or less the same time as Emily. 
Would you consider a shared class at the start? This would cut the price by 30% and would be less money to spend on something that you don't know your daughter will like. Oh, thanks for the offer, Mrs. Irving. But I think I'd like Emily to have the lessons on her own. I think she'll develop her motivation better that way. No problem. I just wanted to ask in case you felt like saving some money. Now, there's an important child protection issue that I need to bring up, as I will be responsible for your child. How will she come to the lessons and how will she go home? Thanks for thinking of that. We live so close that driving or taking the bus would be silly. Emily's very confident, so she'll come on foot, even in bad weather. We will come with her and be there to pick her up at the end. Good. That's something I always worry about. Will you be the only person in the house during the lessons? Will any of your family be here, for example? No. My husband died a few years ago, and my daughter has a place of her own now. Sometimes the cleaner works during the times of Emily's lessons, but she won't be any problem. OK, thank you. Is there anything that Emily should bring with her? A paper and pencil, for example? Nothing like that. What might be good, though, is a snack, as children of her age often will get hungry. We can have a short break after half an hour for it. OK, I'll remember that. Finally, Mr Johnson, how would you like to pay for Emily's lessons? I can give you bank details for a transfer, or I still take cheques. I'd rather give Emily cash and she can give that to you every lesson. Is that OK? Of course. I don't know anyone who turns that down. That's better for me than a bank transfer or cheque. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a woman on a radio program giving some information about saving energy in the home. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the radio program and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone. My name is Alexandra and I'm an expert in domestic energy conservation. I've been invited to come on today's show to give you some advice for saving energy in the home. To begin with, I'd like to tell you some strategies that nearly all householders can take advantage of. First of all, I'd like to talk about standby mode on appliances. Almost all electrical and electronic appliances can be turned off at the plug without upsetting their programming. You may also want to think about getting a standby saver, which allows you to turn off all your appliances that are on standby in one go. Most households can save up to $50 a month by doing this. The washing machine is another place where savings can be made on electricity. Many people wash clothes at 40 degrees Celsius, but cutting this to 30 degrees Celsius would reduce electricity use by 40% over a year, saving around $50 annually on energy bills. Another electrical saving can be made by turning lights off when you're not using them. This can save an average wasteful household around $60 a year on the annual energy bill. Finally, employing energy-saving bulbs all around the house could cut electricity bills by $60 a year. Next, I'd like to talk about people's showers. 
If you've got a shower that takes hot water straight from your boiler or hot water tank rather than an electric shower, fit a water-efficient shower head. This will reduce your hot water usage while retaining the sensation of a powerful shower. A water-efficient shower head could save a four-person household $100 a year on gas for water heating, as well as a further $150 on water bills. In addition, spending one minute less in the shower each day will save around $15 off your energy bills each year, per person, as well as reductions off the annual water and sewerage bills. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the radio program and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I'd like to talk about heat and heat conservation. First of all, it's absolutely essential to have various forms of insulation. Places for home insulation include the roof, walls and floors, and pipes and hot water tanks. Making sure your home is well insulated can significantly reduce unnecessary heat loss leading to lower energy bills and a more comfortable home. Another type of insulation can be to deal with drafts. Unless your home is very new, you will lose some heat through drafts around doors and windows, gaps around the floor or through the chimney. The draft proofing of windows and doors and blocking cracks in floors and skirting boards can cost around $300 but can save up to $50 to $60 a year on energy bills. People also need to take control of the heating of their houses. More than half the money spent on fuel bills goes towards providing heat and creating hot water. Having a room thermostat, a programmer and thermostatic radiator valves installed could save between $150 and $200 a year. Even turning down a room thermostat by just one degree can save around $120 a year. In addition to these controls, smart heating controls are the latest innovation to help you control your heating and understand your energy use. They allow people to control their heating remotely via a mobile app, meaning that they can manage the temperature of their homes from wherever they are at whatever time of day. That is the end of section 2. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student and her teacher discussing the student's essay. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi there, Dr. Masters. Do you have some time to speak to me about my essay? Hi, Kate. Yes, I've got time right now. Sit down. Thank you. Now, how can I help you? To start with, I'd like to ask you about sources. Of course. Well, as you know, I'm writing about environmental conservation. I was in the library, and I found that book you recommended on deforestation in South America. 
It's called The Diminishing Forest. Good. Was it helpful? Very. I was worried, though, that some of the statistics it had were a little out of date, as it was published 15 years ago. Yes, I can see that might be a problem. What you can do is to check out the book's website. The authors have up-to-date statistics there that you can use. The website is also a mine of information on the types of pesticides and insecticides used in different areas of the continent. Thanks, that's helpful. Now, I also looked up the Journal of Environmental Management, as you suggested. The trouble there was that there is an issue every month, and they don't often discuss South America. I've gone through some editions, but it hasn't been very useful so far. I see. Well, I know that publication very well. Last year, in the months of May, June, and July, there were some excellent articles on forestry plantation initiatives in South American countries. Look at those editions, and I'm sure you'll find something of use. Okay, thanks. Finally, the reason a lot of deforestation takes place in South America seems to be concerned with creating more farmland. I wanted to explore this in South American countries, but as that's not my subject, I didn't know where to start. There's a good book called The Green Pastures. This gives a good review of this subject in various South American countries over the last 20 years. It also documents the rise of cattle farming in Argentina and Brazil, as those are the two big players in that industry. I read that those countries supply the fast food industry with their meat. Yes, they can produce it at a much reduced price per kilogram compared to the U.S., and so that industry has really thrived recently. Okay, well, that really helps me with my sources, Dr. Masters. You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. Is there anything else, Kate? Yes, I wanted to know if you knew anything about government enforcement of environmental law. A little. Many of the nation's environmental statutes contain both civil and criminal provisions to address environmental law violations. I did a paper on that in the context of the United States recently. What kind of things can the U.S. government do? It firstly depends on what kind of prosecution is taken, civil or criminal. What's the difference? Civil action can take two forms. Civil administrative actions are non-judicial enforcement actions usually taken by a state under its own authority and they do not involve a judicial court process. These actions can be a notice of violation or an order directing an individual, a business, or other entity to take action to come into compliance or to clean up a site. The order can be with or without penalties. What's the other form of civil action? They are civil judicial actions. They are formal lawsuits that are filed in court against persons or entities that have failed to comply with statutory or regulatory requirements, failed to comply with an administrative order, failed to pay the costs for cleaning up a polluted site, or failed to commit to doing the cleanup work. These cases are not filed by the relevant state but by the U.S. Department of Justice, which does it for them. And what about criminal actions in the U.S.? They are much rare. Criminal actions are usually reserved for the worst violations and those that are willful or knowingly committed. A court conviction can result in fines or imprisonment. What are the civil penalties like? They are determined by the severity of the crime. Civil penalties are monetary assessments imposed on a person or regulated entity due to a violation or non-compliance. Penalties represent an incentive for coming into compliance and staying in compliance with the environmental statutes and regulations. Penalties are also designed to recoup the economic benefit of non-compliance and to compensate for the seriousness of the violation. That's great, Dr. Masters. That helps a lot. You're welcome. I know that wasn't much to do with South America. That's okay. A lot of the countries there have based their judicial systems regarding the environment on the U.S. model. That is the end of Section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.
now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture on plastic pollution in the ocean. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone. Today we'll be discussing plastics pollution and, more specifically, microplastics. In recent years, plastic pollution in the ocean has become a significant environmental concern for governments, scientists, non-governmental organisations and members of the public worldwide. A recent study, derived from six years of research by the Five Gyres Institute, estimated that five and a quarter trillion plastic particles weighing some 269,000 tonnes are now floating on the surface of the sea. World plastics production has experienced almost constant growth for more than half a century rising from approximately 1.9 million tonnes in 1950 to approximately 330 million tonnes in 2013. Today, the World Bank estimates that 1.4 billion tonnes of trash are generated globally each year, 10% of it plastic. The International Maritime Organization has banned the dumping of plastic waste at sea. However, an unknown portion of the plastic produced each year escapes into the environment instead of being landfilled, incinerated or recycled. Some of it eventually makes its way to sea. At the same time, plastics in consumer products have become subject to increasing scrutiny regarding their potential effects on human health. Various components of polycarbonate plastics and endocrine disruptors are examples of the most widely known polluting chemicals. However, these are only two of the many monomers, plasticizers, flame retardants, antimicrobials and other chemicals used in plastics manufacturing that are able to migrate into the environment. Today, there is a lot of funding from private and public sources that has permitted research on human exposures to plastics in water, and the potential health risks. Studies have already demonstrated plastic's tendency to absorb persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substances, which are present in trace quantities in almost all water bodies. The constituents of plastics, as well as the chemicals and metals they absorb, can travel into the bodies of marine organisms upon consumption where they may concentrate and climb the food chain, ultimately into humans. The path from plastic pollution to chemical exposure through seafood is a long one, figuratively and often literally, and researchers say that tracing all the individual steps in that theoretical journey is not the same as identifying human health effects. Actual contacts with chemicals are determined by innumerable variables and still need to be quantified. Then these levels must be evaluated within broader contexts of consumer plastic use and environmental pollutant levels. Plastics that reach the ocean will gradually break down into ever smaller pieces due to sunlight exposure, oxidation and the physical action of waves, currents and grazing by fish and birds. So-called microplastics, variably defined in the scientific literature and popular press as smaller than five millimetres in diameter, are understood to be the most abundant type of plastic in the ocean. 
Researchers have found microplastics in varying concentrations almost everywhere, from nearshore environments to the open ocean, and they have estimated that particles 4.75 millimetres or smaller, about the size of a lentil, make up roughly 90% of the total plastic pieces they collected. Collecting, counting and typing plastics are the first steps in understanding the extent of plastic pollution in specific areas, and large organisations have asked the public for their assistance. This will save millions of research dollars. The public has been asked to sample seawater for floating microplastics near where they live and log the results on a website. In order to conduct the research, they've invented a low-cost, do-it-yourself collection apparatus called a baby legs. The device starts with a plastic bottle top surrounded by corks from bottles to keep it floating. The open end of the bottle can be dragged along the surface of the sea. Water and any microplastics go in through the opening. Behind the water bottle top, a pair of baby's tights is attached. The seawater will flow through the material, but any microplastics will be stopped. Of course, it's not only the sea that can be sampled. A baby legs can be used equally effectively to capture small plastics that tend to float on the surface of oceans, lakes and rivers. The tights should be of a very bright colour to help recognise the contamination in the samples. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of listening test 17. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.